I think it will be have enormous influence, not just on the future of the US, but on the future of the entire world. The current administration has abdicated. We don't want to lead anybody. We care only about America, America first. We care only about ourselves. We saw this with the COVID-19 crisis. Whereas in previous crisis, whether it was the Ebola epidemic of 2014 or the global financial crisis of 2008, the US took a leadership role. Now, the US administration wasn't leading even the effort within the US. Even within the US, the Trump administration basically gave up its responsibility. If Trump is now re-elected president, after all that, then this will be kind of the final statement from the American public that we are no longer interested in leading the world and it will, be our, it will lead to the collapse of the international system that we have known in the last few decades. And I don't know what kind of system will replace it. I do know that the world desperately needs global cooperation and some kind of global leadership to deal not just with the immediate COVID-19 crisis, but also with the much bigger crisis of ecological collapse and of the technological disruption of technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning, bioengineering. If we can't cooperate globally on, on that, there is no way to deal with these challenges. If we have, and we already have, an arms race in artificial intelligence, it doesn't really matter who wins the arms race, the loser will be humanity. All the most dangerous scenarios are likely to be realized, and this could result in the collapse of, really the collapse of human civilization. Because we are dealing here with powers beyond anything we've encountered so far in history. The last time we had such a big technological revolution was in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution. And eventually humans learned how to harness the power of the Industrial Revolution to benefit us, to produce more food, better medicine, better infrastructure. So human life got, eventually it got better. Now we get powers which are far beyond steam engines and electricity. AI and bioengineering are bigger, much bigger than that. And we don't have any room for experimentation, for a learning curve. If we again make mistakes, we don't get a second chance. If we have th the uh, World War III, or if we have a new totalitarian regime based on AI and bioengineering, we won't be able to get out of it. We have to get it right the first time. I think it's extremely unfortunate and dangerous what is happening. We are facing enormous challenges for humankind, especially the ecological challenge and the rise of artificial intelligence and other disruptive technologies. And the only way to solve these, to overcome these challenges is through global cooperation. China can't do it alone. The US can't do it alone. India can't do it alone. Europe can't do it alone. And if we enter an escalating Cold War, an escalating arms race in fields like AI, this means there will be no global cooperation and really no way to overcome these challenges. So we are facing, if this continues, we are facing ecological collapse and a technological disruption of our economies, societies, and political systems. Deliberately dividing their own country and exaggerating the differences and the divides between people. We've reached a point 
when Americans fear other Americans far more than they fear or hate the Russians or the Chinese. So there is a lot of talk about, you know, the resurgence of nationalism, but actually we see the collapse of nationalism. Nationalism is not about hating foreigners, it's about loving your compatriots. And there is less and less love like this in the world. Some countries already collapse into civil war, like Syria or Libya or Yemen. In the US, you see the two parties hating one another more and more, and at least some politicians are deliberately increasing these fires by using divisive policies and rhetoric. But I hope Americans will remember that when it comes to the basics, they still mostly agree. They mostly agree about the basic vision of a democratic government, that people should be allowed to choose their government as they wish and not having a government against their desires. We want to, to test whether somebody is a liberal. You ask three questions. First, do you think people should have the right to choose their own government instead of obeying some king? Second, do you think people should have the right to choose their own job instead of just doing whatever their parents did? And thirdly, should people have the right to choose their own spouse, whom to marry, instead of just marrying whoever their parents or priests choose for them? If you answer all three questions, yes, people should have these rights to choose, then you are a liberal. Americans will remember that, yes, some things divide them, but they still share the same basic values. And that democracy is not about deciding the truth. Democracy is about reaching a peaceful compromise. That we don't see enough solidarity and cooperation between different countries and different regions. Humanity is much, much stronger than this virus. We can easily overcome it if we act wisely. Our big enemy is not a virus. Our big enemy is the inner demons of humanity. If we react to this crisis by generating hatred, blaming the epidemic on foreigners and minorities, if we react by generating greed, just thinking how to make money out of it, and if we react by generating ignorance, believing all kinds of ridiculous conspiracy theories, then that's the great danger. The crisis will overwhelm us. But we have a choice. As human beings, we can choose to react not with hatred, but with compassion. Blaming foreigners for the epidemic, cooperate with them, share information, learn from their experience, work together to develop a vaccine and treatments, then it will be much easier. The future depends on the decisions we make today. When you look at the epidemic, whether it will result in this or that, it's not predetermined, it depends on, on how we act. The epidemic can cause, for example, the rise of totalitarian and authoritarian regimes, that this is the best way to deal with epidemics and give up their rights and freedoms. That's one way. But people can also realize, no, it's possible to deal with an epidemic in a democratic way. Actually, democracies have an advantage mm -hmm. over dictatorships in a crisis. It's true that dictatorships can usually make decisions faster because you don't need to convince anybody. You don't need to compromise. Just one person makes a decision. That's it. It's fast. But the downside is that if they make a mistake, it's very difficult for them to admit that they were mistaken and to try something else. So dictatorships make decisions fast, but if they make the wrong decision, they are stuck with it for a long time. Democracies take longer, maybe, to make a decision, but there is room for more views. And over the long run, this is a better system. 
because nobody is perfect. So if people realize that, then even this crisis can actually serve to uh, encourage the spread and deepening of democracy in the world. So what will it be in, in 10 years? Will the world be more democratic or less democratic? I don't know, because it depends on the decisions we make today. I've been extremely impressed by the amazing success of your country in dealing with the COVID-19 epidemic. It's yes. really a kind of model, an inspiration for the whole world. I had a conversation with one of your ministers, Audrey Tang, about this and about other issues. In the 21st century, all countries should learn from one another. That Taiwan has so much to teach the rest of the world and also to learn from the rest of the world. And what my new book really tries to do is give people a global perspective. How history looks like from the viewpoint of the entire species. It's not a book about Israel or Taiwan or Canada or Brazil. It's a book about humanity, where we came from and where we are going.